This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at the BatmanUniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. In 2008, a podcast was created with one goal. To bring Bat fans around the world news related to movies, comics, video games, television, merchandise, and so much more. And now, the Batman Universe Podcast has returned. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of the TV Podcast. Soon, BJ and Scott are with me today, and we are talking about Shazam! Fury of the Gods. Um, the movie came out this past week. We are going to be talking all about um, the film itself, the villains, the cast, um, our favorite scenes, the post credit scenes, and what the future holds for The Flash as well. Um, but before we get into that, uh, there wasn't any new news to discuss uh, this from this past week. Uh, but however, there was, in fact... Um, some stuff from Gunwatch. So to get it out of the way up front, I want to cover Gunwatch. Um, there's just a couple of quick things. Uh, the very first one we've got is James Gunn, in fact, confirming that he is going to be uh, directing the Superman film. Um, he said that when he originally started to f- uh, put the script together, he was not intending on, uh, it was not intentional for him to direct the film. Uh, but basically he says, yes, I'm directing Superman Legacy to be released on July 11th, 2025. My brother Matt told me when he saw the release date, uh, he started to cry. I asked him why. He said, dude, it's dad's birthday. I hadn't realized. Uh, I lost my dad almost three years ago. He was my best friend. He didn't understand me as a kid, but he supported my love of comics and my love of film, and I wouldn't be making this movie now without him. It has been a long road to this point. I was offered Superman years ago. I initially said no because I didn't have a way in that felt unique and fun and emotional that gave Superman the dignity he deserved. Then a bit Less than a year ago, I saw my way in, in many ways centering around Superman's heritage, how both his aristocratic Kryptonian parents and his Kansas farmer parents inform who he is and the choices he makes. So I chose to finally take on writing the script, but was hesitant to direct despite the constant pestering by Peter Safran and many others to commit. Uh, just because I write something doesn't mean I feel it in my bones visually and emotionally enough to spend over two years directing it, especially not something of this magnitude. But the long and short of it is I love the script and I'm incredibly excited as we begin this journey up, up and away. So um, not super surprised uh, overall. Uh, Tom King, to a degree, kind of spoiled this as we talked about last week. Um, he said that that uh, James Gunn was going to be directing, even though nobody had confirmed that. So it, I guess it was just a matter of Gunn getting out in front of it and confirming that he is, in fact, directing it. Um, my only hesitation with this is that um, I hope that what we see from Gunn is very different than some of the other things we've seen. Um, Gunn has, in my opinion, a very specific style um, that can be a little bit goofy at times. When you look at Guardians of the Galaxy and you look at uh, the Suicide Squad and Peacemaker, they're they're kind they they kind of are a little goofy. And I can see him trying to do something drastically different here um, with his directorial style and obviously with what he's writing too. Um, but I just hope that we see something different from what we typically see from James Gunn. Yeah, I mean, last time I kind of said I wasn't really into it with him directing, but, you know, now that it's been confirmed, give it a fair shake. I hope, like, the post that he put it with was kind of a little more emotional, so I hope, like, that's, you know, I'm thinking about it, like, the emotions behind that post and everything. I'm hoping that that's kind of like there's this heartbeat there that really carries through, and if that's, like, this, you know, family ties, 
relationship drama at the heart of, heart of Superman. I'm looking forward to it, and I want to give it a fair shake and hope for the best because, you know, overall, he is a really good filmmaker. So while he may not have been my first pick for Superman, let's see what he can do. Yeah, like you guys said, um, wasn't much of a surprise. I think we all kind of assumed he was going to direct. But yeah, I'm excited. I'm kind of, I'm kind of, hundred percent backing James Gunn. Uh, I think he's smart enough to know that there's going to be a lot of pressure with this film more than anything he's ever kind of done before. But I think he'll be up to the task. All right, now we move on to some completely opposite news. Um, ben Affleck uh, was interviewed by the Hollywood Reporter. And uh, he had a very interesting quote that came out. Now, if you remember back in December, uh, James Gunn, I believe, uh, or I think it was actually Affleck himself, he had came out and said that, like, um, he, you know, is looking forward to seeing what James Gunn did. And I believe James Gunn made a comment about, like, we're in talks with uh, Ben to see, you know, how he can have some part of the future of the DC universe. And it, it left it. You know, as a, in a way, at least in my opinion, that it was open for the possibility of seeing something from Ben Affleck, not him necessarily returning as Batman, not necessarily him, you know, being Batman in anything, but more of a we appreciate Ben as a as a creator, and if he has a project that he you know is is interested in, we're willing to hear about it, and it seemed like everybody was on good terms. And then this, this uh, interview comes out and Ben Affleck has basically said, uh, there's absolutely no way that he's going to do anything within this new universe that uh, James Gunn's putting together, which is so drastically different than the comments that James Gunn made. You have to wonder why is this happening? I don't know the hypotheses and theories online that people are guessing are saying that basically, um, this is his way of like siding with Snyder. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't believe that at all. I think it's, he is just moving on. He's, he did his time in DC universe. He's, you know, he had ideas of what to do for a Batman film. Those, those ideas didn't end up materializing into a real thing. And I think he's just, he's moved on. That's why he's saying he absolutely has no desire to come back and do anything DC. I don't think he's crapping on DC. He has all, already said that he, you know, likes James Gunn and he's interested to see what he's doing, but he is moving on. That's not to say that he couldn't, you know, change his mind in the future, but I think that it's just so abruptly different than what Gunn perceived back in December that I think a lot of people are thinking that something bad has happened behind the scenes, and I don't think that's the case. Yeah, I don't know what to make of it because it's kind of hard to like see past like all the headlines and like drama this gets turned into on the internet. I guess in my head canon, and I have to take a stab at it. I think there were just creative differences. Ben Affleck probably really wanted to do a Batman movie where there was a scene where Bruce Wayne and Selena Kyle have a romantic play fight on a kid's playground, and James Gunn said no, and so it's not happening, and so he walked away. Yeah, I, I agree that um, it might be uh, Ben just putting the final nail in the coffin that he's kind of stepping away from the superhero game after after the Flash. And, you know, Ben's a Boston guy. I'm a Boston guy. Maybe it's Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, weren't that good that morning before he had this interview, so he just was kind of a little more angry than usual. I mean, ultimately, it's probably that he's spending too much time at his new job at Dunkin' Donuts, and that's why he <laughs> he can't actually direct. <laughs> right, those drive throughs are long, man. Those yeah, exactly. Are long. All right. So the next bit of news we've got is that there's some been some additional casting for um, the Penguin. Um, the we know now that uh, Michael Zegan, who's from uh, the Marvelous Ms. Maisel, uh, James Matteo, and Scott Cohen are all reported to uh, join Colin Farrell. Um, basically, we don't know specifically who each one of them are playing. We're assuming that one of them could end up being uh, Albert Falcone. Um, but the other bit of news was kind of interesting. There was a um, comment that was made about how... Um, that, well, there was a comment that got made, and then James Gunn decided to follow up on it. But the comment that was made was by an account called The Art of the Batman. And it said, Robert Pattinson might not appear as Batman in the Penguin series, but can still appear as Bruce Wayne or the Drifter. The TV rights for Batman are caught up in a legal limbo involving Fox, Disney, and a trio of mergers. Then uh, James Gunn responded, this is not true. Now, I just have to wonder to myself, where in the world 
Fox and Disney would be involved in anything related to Batman. The only thing I can think of is that for some reason they're referencing the Batman 66 series, which was Fox owned, um, aired on ABC, which wasn't owned at Di- by Disney at the time. Now Disney owns Fox, but those rights got sorted out years ago. Uh, that's why we ended up getting the 60 series on DVD and Blu-ray. Um, and it wasn't for a very long time because they needed to make that deal happen. And it did. Um, so, but the other side of it is the assumption that Batman can't appear, but Bruce Wayne could doesn't make any sense considering Bruce Wayne is a, uh, trademark figure just as much as Batman is. So I don't know why he wouldn't be able to appear considering the Fox series, the 66 series had Bruce Wayne appearing too. So None of it makes any sense. I don't know what they were thinking by this. But the other side of this is that we've already been, we've already, I'm positive we've already been told from Matt Reeves that Batman could appear in these other series. Um, not necessarily as the main focus or, you know, the the highlight of what what we're seeing, but there was no there, there was no understanding that there was no reason that it couldn't happen. Um, I just the, the news that comes out sometimes regarding some of these projects is mind boggling that uh, people are convinced of some sort of like made up news that nobody has ever actually said. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it seems like once Gunn and Saffron took over, it's just been like rumors, you know, nonstop with all sorts of weird just internet articles hitting on anything and everything they could like itch at that turn out to mostly be untrue. And the way I look at it, it's probably easier for Batman to appear than Bruce Wayne, just for the sheer fact that depending on how you're filming Batman and how you're incorporating them, certain scenes only need a stunt double or a bat suit double, we should say. So, you know, who knows, but I don't think that's true at all. I think that's just nonsense. Nothing gives me a bigger headache than trying to figure out rights and which, which studio owns who, which character, and all that. So, I did. Th- I did think. Uh, I agree with you, Dustin. I did think we heard we heard something that Matt Reeves said that Batman could appear. Yeah, and we all kind of speculated that it would be the final episode or whatever of whatever show. Yeah, and it, I just don't understand. So I, I I clicked on the source article, which is a uh, comic book resources article that where this news originated from, and. Not to crap on other websites, but I'm going to. Um, the reality of it is that comic book resources has become, you know, very much like Screen Rant or BuzzFeed, where they're just churning out articles on a uh, extremely high pace, and it's not always the greatest content in the world. And I'm not trying to sit here and say that every content that TBU puts out is the most amazing piece of content in the world. However. Um, Making up random things is kind of a strange thing. So the article itself, it talks about uh, Kinney National Service, Inc. purchased DC Comics in the late 1960s along with Warner Brothers um, and then became Warner Brothers Communication by 1972. This purchase helped secure the TV and film distribution rights to the vast library of DC characters Except for one, the 1960s Batman TV series starring Adam West was produced by 20th Century Fox before the Warner deal. In 2009, Warner Brothers entered into talks with Fox, the estate of Adam West, and other parties for the rights of the characters from the 60s Batman, the actor's likeness, and the future of the Bat on TV, according to Variety. The result is likely why Gotham aired on Fox Network during its run. Still, Batman never appeared except for in one last shot of the show, something that was justified as a creative decision. The details of the deal have never been disclosed publicly, so the speculation abounded. The TV rights were tied up like Batman's film rights, which were purchased by, uh, from DC Comics by Michael Uslan and Benjamin Melkenlerker in 1979. So all of that information that I just read... Um, half of that, I understand, you know, why there could be some confusion. Um, there was a bunch of, you know, purchases. However, my understanding was there was never a situation where Warner Brothers didn't own the TV rights. And all all you have to do is go back to the idea of there's a TV rights for what what, are you just ignoring all of the animated shows? I mean, the animated shows came out in the nineties. That was way before 2009 when these other talks initiated, uh, Batman was in a ton of cartoons, including ones that had Adam West voicing Batman in the 1970s and the 1980s. So none of that makes a whole lot of sense as to why. And and if you're immediately saying, okay, it can only be live action. Okay. But then you got to go back to 2005 when, 
or, or the early 2000s, that is, when the Chris Nolan films were just getting off the ground. And there was the bat mandate that certain characters could not appear in the animated shows if they were going to be appearing in uh, the live action form. And it was also the reason why Batman couldn't appear in Smallville because of the bat embargo, as it was known. And it's kind of crazy that everybody who has been around the Batman universe for the last couple of decades are as well aware of the bat embargo. And that was the reason why they ended up using Green Arrow on Smallville instead of Batman. It had nothing to do with random TV rights from a show that was from, you know, 40 or 50 years prior to that. So mind boggling that content like this ends up getting traction but again warner brothers has the rights to batman it's not a a matter of fox still owns rights to a character from a show that they had from you know at this point 60 years ago yeah honestly it just seems like a problem of people spitting out old content not really researching it and not doing the diligence of maybe like making a phone call yeah or emailing someone who would be in the know yeah exactly all right, and then the final gun watch is uh, one that uh, kind of deals with what we're talking about, um, and the we're going to be talking about Shazam here, but the last one is actually a tweet from uh, David Sandberg, who is the director of Shazam, and he specifically posted, on Rotten Tomatoes, I just got my lowest critic score and my highest audience score on the same film. Uh, Then he put a shrugging emoji. I wasn't expecting a repeat of the first movie critically, but I was still a little surprised because I think it's a good film. Oh, well. As I've been saying for a while now, I'm eager to go back to horror as well as trying some new things. After six years of Shazam, I'm definitely done with superheroes for now. And then he went on to say, just to be clear, I don't regret even for a second making the Shazam movies. I've learned so much and gotten to work with some truly amazing people. Will forever be grateful and got that I got to direct these two. They've been very challenging but valuable experiences. One thing I've really been looking forward to is disconnecting from the superhero discourse online. A lot of that stresses me out so much and it will be nice not having to think about that anymore. Before we get into our Shazam review, I think it's interesting to note the box office for Shazam, uh, the film film ended up at about $30.1 million its opening weekend. It opened on a significant number of screens. Um, I, you know, not to spoil exactly, you know, our review or anything, but I thought it was a good film. Um, I think the thing is, there's been some weird timing issues. That, so the week before, Scream 6 came out and made a, a good chunk of money in one week. Uh, this past week, that film made half as much as Shazam. And then there's also Creed 3, which is holding over from a couple weeks back as well. Um, you still have Ant-Man that came out uh, last month. Uh, there's just, in general, a lot of stuff that's been holding out and still you know, making money. Um, I think that Shazam has the possibility of still making more money because Spring Break's coming up. And at least the theater that I was at had a ton of parents with kids at it. So it's not as if it can't, you know, have more people see this film. Um, but it is surprising how it ended up where it was. Um, I will say, based off of just the box office a- analyst, because I'm not going to dive into critic reviews, um, the first film did fine, it did okay. Um, I will say, as a whole, I think that this film was put together better. It could you could tell that they had more money. It was really funny because before the movie started, there was like, you know, the typical promo stuff and and commercials that they air prior to the trailers. And there was a quick promo that had Zachary Levi like promoting the film, and he was like, "Yeah, we're making the second film. Uh, we the, we basically we you know there's more family, there's more this, there's more that, uh, but we got more money, so we were able to do a lot more things that we couldn't do in the first film." That was extremely evident. You could tell that they had more money to do more things in this film. The effects were, you know, grander in scale. The scope of everything that was happening was grander in scale. Um, You could tell that they really did something. So I just hope that what we're seeing is not an effect of what just, you know, like a fallout from uh, Black Adam. Because this movie by far was better than Black Adam. Um, I'm hoping that the movie can make a bunch more money in the next couple weeks as spring break approaches for a lot of uh, people here in the United States. But um, I mean, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I kind of, I don't know. I feel like David, like, it's, I guess it's hard. Like, when you're a director of something that comes out and you get hit with, you know, just the internet of, 
of all things, you know, everyone commenting on your movies, and then you have all these stupid aggregate sites that really aren't worthwhile, in my opinion. They're just aggregates, and they're not always entirely accurate. They try to numerize something or turn something into a number that, you know, in some cases, when you read reviews that are either positive or negative, sometimes the content and copy of those reviews is a little more nebulous and rides the wrong line of being neither. So I thought it was a lot of fun too. I had a good time. And I also, you know, time tells on some of these things. Sometimes things flop when they come out, but they become called classics. You know, not saying it'll make a lot of money probably, but you know, it could have the weird effect that like the last Avatar hat film had where everyone like the opening weekend, everyone was like, oh, my God, it did terrible. But then it like stayed in theaters for a while because people ended up actually going to see it. Um, who knows? But it's just I hope he like doesn't pay attention to that stuff too much and just enjoys the work he did. And, uh, you know, reads just the positive comments of all the people having fun because everybody else I've talked to, I've seen a lot more people go to the theaters for this one than I normally see, like a lot of my friends and, you know, co-workers, and that's because they have families and they're all taking their kids and they're all really enjoying it. And usually these people don't actually go and end up seeing movies, so there's an audience for it. Yeah, I hope, uh, yeah, someone sends Sandberg a link of uh, my review. I was very positive for I think he'll be happy to read it, but uh, I did say, I, I think both movies have been really good. I enjoyed the first one. I really liked this one. Um, I went last night uh, around seven. I think it was a pretty, my theater was kind of solidly packed for the time I went and there were kids there on a Sunday night. Uh, but yeah, I like Sandberg. I said in the review, I hope they could carve out a space for him uh, in this new universe or whatever to do. And maybe he'll take a break and maybe he'll miss it and come back or, who knows what i'm sure we'll get into with the future of shazam but yeah i really like the movie overall yeah and with that we're going to lead straight into our review um kind of spoiler free three uh, spoiler free thoughts uh, we kind of just gave those um i thought it was a good movie um like i said everything that i just said in relation to the defense of sandberg um holds true i thought this was a better movie than the first one it's not that the you know like I can't specifically nail one specific thing. We it's funny because uh so my I encouraged my kids to watch the first one again before since it's been some time since um since the first one came out and I they had already seen it and they really enjoyed it out of a lot of the DC films that had came out but they were watching it and I rem- and I watched some of it because I you know I wanted to see a little bit of it but I was seeing certain sequences and just thinking like, yeah, I mean, this, it was a good fun film. The first one, the second one, when I went into the theater, I, I'll be honest, I did not have crazy high expectations, mostly because I don't think the trailer did a great job of like making it like a, Hey, this is a must see film. Um, I really felt like the trailer was giving away too much, but I didn't know for sure because I hadn't seen the film yet. But I specifically, you know, like talking about the dragon, like the dragon shows up in the second trailer. I thought the dragon was going to be like part of like the third act. And it was. But the thing is, like, it was way more than just here's a dragon. There was a lot more that wasn't shown in the trailer. And I'm not saying that they need to show everything in the trailer. But I think the trailer didn't do a great job of really like showing what it was other than, hey, Shazam is a goofy superhero and he does goofy things because he's a kid and that's it, you know, like that's the, the side of it. The other thing that um, I will say, like when it comes to the, this, you know, the, the sequel is that I thought the villains were a little bit more like thought through than the, uh, the, the previous film. Um, you know, I would have, would have, I loved to see Mr. Mind. Absolutely. Because Mr. Mind is a cool idea of a villain. That's just so out there. Um, but I think this worked, you know, they did a great job of explaining things. Um, I thought everything was, there was a lot more character development with a lot of the different characters, not just Billy Batson. Um, there was just a lot more to, you know, to enjoy about this film and it's not taking anything away from the first one. I just think that this was, in my opinion, better than the first one. Uh, Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. I thought, you know, for starters, this one had the comedic beats and timing down really well. Like it's, he did 
Sandberg and the creative team did a really great job just like hitting all the right notes and like just you know keeping it like feeling fun and fluid and then incorporating the action action elements in a way that doesn't really detract from the humor so much you know to where like throughout the whole film like I laughed you know quite a bit and you know sometimes like I'm a hard sell on like hokey or campy comedy in movies but no, it was that was really good. And, you know, I like the idea that, you know, even though it is like a silly superhero and everything, A, they kept kind of the theme of family from the first film. They kept that core. But B, they found a new way to play with it. You know, they they wanted to keep their characters moving along. You know, they're aging and growing and they're dealing with new problems. And so they found suitable arcs for the characters to play with and to make it feel... You know, like you're watching like a real movie and not just like a vehicle to sell toys or just like for cheap jokes for an hour and a half. Like it felt like a really greatly crafted, you know, just original movie that hits the beats you would expect and then tries to shoot a little higher. You know, it. Yeah, Sandberg, I thought, well, this movie as a whole hit kind of every note that you want. You want the big action scenes, you want the moments of levity and comedy and heart and. Even Samber, you could see some, there were some little horror elements too, showing his horror background, which I thought were mixed in pretty well. Um, so yeah, overall, I thought it kind of hit on every note and like, it did kind of give me everything I wanted for. I will say like uh, Zachary Levi said, everything had more. There was more family, um, more of the family, not only as kids, but more of them growing up with their powers. So we saw a lot more of them than we did in the first movie. I like that Dario Bava name for that pediatrician. Talk about horror <laughs> references there. I saw that in the theater and I like had to lead over to my brother and be like, that's two horror directors. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's talk about, so that's spoiler free. So if you don't want to have any more spoilers, uh, now's the time you, you turn away. Uh, but you heard what we thought. It was a good film. Uh, so definitely check it out if you haven't. But we're going to get into a lot more spoilers here. So uh, next up, villains and the plot. Um, so this film had villains that I have no problem saying I was completely unfamiliar with. I didn't know anything about them. I'm not super dialed into the world of Shazam. So I, I you know, like I didn't know if there were somebody that existed, somebody that was new. Um, I didn't, I still don't know. Cause I didn't really look into it to figure out. So, I mean, you guys can tell me if I don't uh, think they are, I think they're original for the movie, which is a really cool idea because it worked. I think it worked well. Um, and like the little connections to the gods and how they were upset because he had the powers of the gods. Um, the whole idea was a cool idea. And then the, like the, the seed that ends up planting into the tree is just randomly sitting into, in the rock of eternity, you know, like it's just, you know, basically a paperweight in this big room that is so important to them. The staff that he broke at the end of the first film being important to get their them their powers back and then needing to meld it the return of the wizard i honestly thought that like they hit so many different things of like combining things from the first one but then introducing new elements i thought the idea of like having these three sisters which it's another interesting thing because the initial uh the marketing did not show the third sister so when she showed up on screen as like a student at the you know the school that they all attend it was kind of like, I know who she is. I obviously, there was some things that I had seen that showed that she was going to be in the film, but it wasn't like a instant, hey, yeah, she's one of the sisters kind of situation. You just knew she was going to be in the film. Um, I thought that it played out well, that like there was a, you know, a range of like one who absolutely wanted to destroy Earth, one that was kind of like, no, that's not what we're doing, but I'm still, you know, looking for revenge and then the one that was just like looking for the good i thought it was a great mix i i really liked the villains and i really thought based off of the trailer i was not going to like them at all i like how they tied like their like the villain family dynamic with like what was going on with the shazam family you know like obviously freddy and the youngest sister like they connect on basically having an overbearing, you know, older sibling. And that's kind of like a through line between two of them that like holds throughout the whole film. So it's not just like the younger sisters just using Freddie. There's like, they do have some kind of a shared bond. And so I thought that was kind of neat. 
and also like you know when they had the cast of villains like Lucy Liu's cool and Helen Mirren's a great actress but I didn't like I kind of thought like superhero movie villains like I don't know but they surprised me and actually Helen Mirren felt very Ian McKellen Magneto-ish to me which I greatly enjoyed I thought that was really cool and she kind of like like that was one of the, my big takeaways is I really liked her in the movie in this role and having that that character kind of like you said where like yeah she wants revenge but she's not like out to just be like world destructor here she just wants what she believes is rightfully hers and to avenge you know their father which also I did a quick google search and while Titan apparently does appear in comics um, the daughters of or Atlas or whatever the daughters do not they're totally made up for the movie so you know in this case it was kind of it was just a neat idea to do that and then the other thing I did really like as an aside was the little shout out reference to the original TV Shazam or Billy yes. Bass yep so thought that was cool. <laughs> yeah, as far as the villains, uh, ironically, uh, The Rock kind of did this movie a favor by not letting uh, Black Adam play with Shazam. So, and I think I saw a tweet by Sandberg or a quote from him saying, like, well, it would have just been um, pretty much kind of the same thing as the first movie because the first movie, Dr. Servana had the same powers as Shazam. So it would have been just the two guys with the same powers fighting each other. So, Thanks, Rock, for kind of uh, having uh, uh, Sandberg and the writers of Shazam, Fear of the Gods, think on their feet and come up with two great new villains because they were kind of, I thought they were pretty menacing. Like that opening scene in the museum when when they break in to get the staff and Lucy Liu, uh, what, I think she's Calypso in the movie, she whispers in their uh, guy's ear and all of a sudden everybody's fighting each other and then they turn them all to sand. That was pretty... That was pretty uh, menacing uh, opening scene. I like that the janitor from Peacemaker was also in that scene, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It all connects. It all connects. Yeah, so um, humor, favorite moments. Uh, let's talk about uh, the Skittles. That was by far one of the uh, craziest things. Um, I kept thinking to myself, maybe there was supposed to be a much bigger marketing push um, between Skittles and the Shazam film, because it wasn't just the one time either. Skittles came up more than once. Um, early on, when they were at the house before they went and saved everybody off the bridge, Mary comes in and goes, Why, "Who put Skittles in my pockets? My, my my pants are all colorful." And the the younger sister immediately goes, "Oh no, it was me. Uh, sorry about that. Whatever." And I was like, "Okay, whatever." It's just randomly mentioning it, no big deal. But then the fact that the Skittles are what makes the unicorns basically able to be tamed by the family who has no powers was kind of amusing. Um, out of nowhere. I will say, like, not, not not necessarily, like, out of nowhere, but, like, such a crazy, crazy, as, as as she's throwing the Skittles up in the air towards it, I'm sitting here thinking, this is like Reese Pieces and E.T. in the 80s. This is what this is. It's it's a new version of that. Skittles and unicorns, you know, like, beast, beastie unicorns. I loved, I loved that. I loved that the unicorns were, like, these, like, menacing, the most feared monsters that, like, came out of, like, all the havoc that was being wrought and like to that and i feel like david sandberg is really showing his love of like monsters there in that in that those final moments too because all those like mythical beasts like the cyclops and you know everything like it just and the harpies which that was him getting picked up by the harpies when the harpies first appeared i caught that right away but um it really felt like it was like a love letter to like the old like ray harry haas and like uh Action adventure epics and everything. So I really, I thought that was cool, and I thought the creature designs were actually really fun to look at, despite a lot of them being like CGI, you know, monsters. They had more of a, I don't know, classic look to them. They didn't look like a lot of like modern CGI monsters. It seemed like there was a little more definition and character to their designs. Yeah, the the Skittles moment, like that was like uh, like I said, uh, a good moment of levity in the film. Like there's a lot going on. Like that's right before kind of during the final battle uh, and we take kind of like a five minute break where uh, Darler's uh, giving Skittles to a unicorn, uh, a menacing unicorn with uh, the wizard right there saying like, this is never going to work. 
and yeah, they paid off the Skittles from way back uh, at the beginning of the movie. So that was really smart. I really like that scene. I mean, it's just a good, is it a goofy scene? Yeah. Did we expect um, Skittles to save the universe? Uh, not really, but it worked. Well, so what were some of your guys' other favorite moments in the film? Uh, um, so when they have to reveal to the family that they're superheroes or to Victor and Rosa, they're, you know, foster parents and they're all standing there and they're like, we're superheroes. But then it's Pedro who's like, I'm gay. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. I think <laughs> that's another fun- thing that was set up early on with his love of baseball. Yeah. I think it was even funnier because everyone was like, oh, we already know. And it's just, yeah. It, yeah. they're so close to each yeah. other that they already know this, but they're yeah. just, it was just amusing because he thought that that was what everybody needed to be told, which is, you know, perfectly understandable, but it was just it, their reactions yeah. are like, oh, yeah, we, we know. So there's no <laughs> surprise there. I loved, um, the wizard uh, throughout the whole movie where he's kind of like this cranky old guy stuck with all these kids that he's given all this power to where he keeps calling Freddy the wrong name. And he's kind of just he's very sarcastic. It was a lot more of the wizard that I kind of liked him throughout the whole movie. Oh, when he's on Wonder Woman's body. That was another. Oh, yeah, that was kind of. <laughs> yeah. Don't close your eyes after that. It's going to be stuck in your brain. All right. So then let's get into the post credit scenes. Um so the first scene, uh, in a way, feels like it at least connects to Black Adam to a degree. Um, so the first scene is um, Harcourt and Economos uh, approaching Shazam as he's target practicing his little uh, his sparkle fingers. Um, and they basically say to him, look, we're looking for you to join the Justice. He immediately says yes. And then he's like, yeah, I can't wait. Uh, I can't wait to work with Batman and Superman. And they're like, no, 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 no. We didn't say Justice League. We said Justice Society. Uh, and then he's like, oh, okay. Well, and then he points out the, you know, an amusing fact of like, well, why do you have all these teams that have like a similar name? Um, you you think you could come up with something else? Um, even pitches the idea of the Avengers um, or the Justice Avengers or whatever he called it. Um so there was that scene, but basically the idea was that Harcourt and Economos are setting up members to join the Justice Society. Um, we saw in Black Adam the Justice Society existing. Dr. Fate is no longer around, but there's still Hawkman. There's still Cyclone and uh, Adam Smasher. That's not to say that there can't be more members, but Shazam does typically follow or fall in with justice society, at least in some incarnations of the team. Um, And also if they were looking to get away from the justice league, that would be the other option would be do the justice society. The problem with this scene is that I feel like it's stuck in this like weird limbo of what actually is going to be the future of, you know, these films, you know, I don't know that it's necessary to have another Shazam film specifically. I'm not saying that they can't do one if they wanted to, but I think they've done a good story with these characters where they can move on and start doing something where maybe they just use the adult versions of the characters if they're going to go that route, because those adults aren't going to age up like the kids. Um, you know, they made a point to point out that Freddie and Billy were going to be 18. Mary was already past 18. So like they needed to figure out a way to get away from the kids. And the way you do that is by having, um, you know, the focus on the adults, which wouldn't be necessary for them to have the kids if it was a, you know, if they were part of a different group or they were part of a larger cast of characters. So, but I still think that, like, to a degree, there's there's a level of like, well, what really does happen in the you know in this existing world? You know, Black Adam exists. They don't mention Black Adam. And I don't know if that was on purpose because Black, you know, they're trying to keep the the stuff separate for at least now. We know that the Suicide Squad or Task Force. Um, and Justice Society exists within the same universe. So there is that, like, you know, small link, but there's still that question of, like, well, what is really, what was the plan with that scene? Because I don't, I just don't see what the plan was other than 
potentially doing a justice society or having the justice society facing off against somebody else. And then Shazam just being part of a larger cast. I mean, I think that's it. It's like, it's vague enough to where if they want to pick up those pieces and make something with it, they totally can. But at the same time, you know, given on what's happened with everything else in the DC, it could just be left on the cutting room floor and just become some teaser that never comes to be. The classic Skeletor saying, I'll be back and yeah. nothing ever happening again. So I don't know. It's just, I would like them to play with that piece. That got me excited. And I think that post, that mid credit scene is, it was really surprising. I didn't, I wouldn't have thought that that would have been a scene they went with. So I was really excited and jazzed about it. Usually I'm kind of like, bored with mid credit or post credit scenes but i don't know i guess we'll find out um was there any like when did they film this scene like is it post gun and saffron like do you know what i mean like because i feel like gun wouldn't like let this see if this was the old regime kind of stay in there kind of like the cavill black adam scene yeah so he had no he had no word on that that's a good call um we know that this film was supposed to release originally in April of 2022. That was the original release date. It got bumped around and moved around. Um, at one point it was in June, then they swapped it with Aquaman, and it was December of 2022, and then it ended up where it was in March of 2023. Um, when this was filmed, I have no idea, but I assume it was filmed during the same time frame of you know, them doing stuff with Black Adam, them doing stuff with the Suicide Squad, because Harcourt and Economos get introduced in that. It could have been filmed maybe even before Peacemaker, because the Peacemaker series wasn't necessarily greenlit before COVID started, by my understanding, because that fell out of the 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 studio liking what Gunn did with the Suicide Squad and then them doing a series, you know, because they could do something quickly with Peacemaker. So it could have been filmed ages ago. And now it seems like it's even more of a thing because Economos and Harcourt have become bigger characters within the confines of the overall DC universe. Yeah, I would feel, I just judging on the scene, like they're in the woods. So it's not like maybe they just kind of filmed it randomly kind of yeah. somewhere like at post post gun taking over so yeah i don't i mean i don't know that's I, just what i thought like right when i kind of saw them like and james gunn's married to uh parkour in real life so it's not like they kinda, yeah like so i like it, it was funny happening. because there was something that happened i think it was like um somebody like a early screen or something somebody saw it and somebody made a comment about like hey james gunn can you stop casting your wife in every single dc film or something like that and he was like I didn't cast her. She was cast way before I ever, you know, had anything to do with the film. She was just part of it, blah, you know, like going back to all the way to the Suicide Squad. Um, so there was an interesting comment that he made related to that, but he didn't like elaborate any further about like, listen, this was filmed way before I was even, you know, like I think personally that this was filmed before he, you know, was part of the head of DC. I don't think that this was put together recently like let's say within the last six months since you know well less than six months since he took over dc studios i don't think this was something that he put in there um i just don't see that i mean we had heard rumors of all kinds of different sequences being filmed for shazam aquaman flash that involved the other members of the justice league that's you know we know that some of them are true when it comes to the flash at least and we know that wonder woman popped up in here in this film so you know it's it's odd to say that uh you know things could have changed or they were really just trying to connect this stuff even if it was loosely I just oh quickly to go back on Wonder Woman. Um oh, no. What do you guys think of like why did they spoil that before the movie came out? Like I I saw that on like I'm watching March Madness all of a sudden I see a Shazam trailer and Wonder Woman's in it. I'm like I don't well, what's what's going on here? Are we still confusion at at the top or what? So I don't know. I didn't see I, that trailer that you're talking about. I'm guessing it was a TV spot, but the only thing yeah, I can think of really- is that they were really trying to do like a last minute marketing push to try to get people to be like, hey, if you like the other stuff, check this out because she's in it. That's the only thing I can think of. Because how yeah. awesome would that final scene have been when all of a sudden they're like, oh, like there's no no go, no more no more gods. 
And yeah, then see, I, she pops up. And like, it was great because I didn't know that yeah. when I went in. I, it was way better. Oh, so, yeah. So, yeah. I Admittedly. Can, yeah, and I already knew she was in it. I felt like it was the weakest part of the movie. Like that is like my one knock against it is I think everybody in this cast is so fun and energetic and having a good time. And even the villains like are kind of like giving it their all that you really see how weak of an actress Gal Gadot is like no offense to her, but I feel like you could put a backpack in her scenes and it would give the same performance. Wow. She's very wooden. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> don't let, don't don't send this uh, podcast to Gal. Yeah, <laughs> and it's just it stood out like I don't a sore thumb. Her on the podcast anytime soon, though. No, <laughs> but yeah. So I, I mean, I, I don't disagree with the idea that it she is very different than the other aspects that we see in the film. I, I do want to go back to one other thing because I I I, I was thinking about this. Um, this is kind of a negative. Um, I like the movie and I don't have any issues with this negative overall, but it's something that I keep going back to whenever I'm thinking about the portrayal of Shazam. So, you know, I, I watched a little bit of the first one before we went and saw the second one. The second one, you know, is great. But the one thing that I never understand is whenever you see Billy Batson in the first or the second film, he's never as goofy as Zachary Levi is when That's, he's Shazam. Yes. I, I don't understand why nobody's caught on to the fact that, like, hey, maybe, just maybe, we should have the character who's being goofy uh, be goofy when he's not that. Like, he, you know, the few sequences, he's not in the film as much as he was in the last one. Um, there's a lot less of him in this film, and I think it's just because he's he's older and he doesn't always, he doesn't come across as, you know, an 18-year-old anymore. I, I, I just don't understand why Shazam is always so like like Zachary Levi's the old version of Shazam is he's always so goofy and silly when it comes to certain things and some of the things he says seems more childish than a kid who's eighteen. Now in the last film he was supposed to be obviously younger, but he was only supposed to be like fifteen or sixteen years old because as they said in this film, two years have been you know, two years have gone by. So the question is if he was 16 before, I don't know how many 16-year-olds, you know, come up with some of the stuff that Zachary Levi does. Like, if you don't have Billy Batson at all and you just have Zachary Levi, it works. It's fine. You're just assuming that this person is a kid. But when you have, like, a teenager doing, you know, like, doing some of the stuff that Zachary Levi does, you would think that's completely out of character. Or it's written for, like, a Disney Channel or a Nickelodeon, you know, sitcom that they have. Yeah, he... When he's uh, Zachary Levi as Shazam, he is. Maybe they could pass it off like, "Oh, this kid's got all this power; nothing's going to hurt him, so he's going to be a little more carefree and cocky." Then. Yeah. But you're right. When he's regular Billy Batson, especially in the first one, he's more. He's he's a bit of a mope, and then he gets the powers, and all of a sudden he's like he's out buying beer with Freddy. So yeah, yeah. I don't. Yeah, that is. I rarely do people bring that up. But yeah. Yeah, I can't argue against that. It's they seems like they might have they could have had the actors kind of model off of each other a little bit more, maybe. Yeah, exactly. All right, then the other post credit scene that happened was at the very end. So the mid credit scene was the recruitment to the Justice Society. The post credit scene at the very end was actually bringing back Savannah and Mister Mind, uh, which I was super pleased with. Um, but it didn't do anything because there was like literally nothing there. So Savannah has grown a beard. He is sitting there. Uh, what appears, excuse me, what he appears to be meditating. And then Mr. Mind randomly appears. And Savannah's like, I've been here for two years. What, what's going on? Nothing's happened. How come nothing's happened? And Mr. Mind just replies, Hey, uh, the reason why nothing's happening is because it takes me forever to get around. I literally have to slither around. It takes me forever. And that was it. And then he's like, oh, I got to go. And he leaves. And then Savannah's like, wait, you didn't tell me anything. And then that that's it. So it like, again, leaves that little, you know, little breadcrumb there for them to pick up on if they ever wanted to in the future. Um, but at this rate, I don't see it happening because, again, I don't think that we're going to see like at this point, we have different aspects of directions that they could go. Um, 
They could go, you know, the Black Adam. It, this, this is, of course, if they were actually going to do something in the near future. They could go the Black Adam route. You feel like that eventually has to happen to some degree. Um, they could go Savannah with Mr. Mind. There's other characters that they could come up with as well. I would really like to hear the story of, like, where the Mr. Mind thing was supposed to go um, with the tease at the end of the last uh, last film because – it feels like they were clearly hinting at something and it wasn't like, hey, we're doing a trilogy of films and that's going to be like the payoff at the third film, um, especially because they end up creating characters for the second film for the villains and the the villains from the first one, including Mr. Minor, straight from the comics. So it's an interesting choice to do that. And now I'm wondering, is this ever actually going to become anything at all? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I mean, I thought Mr. Mine kind of has something to do with controlling the monster society and maybe that's something they can explore in justice society but admittedly i walked out before this post credit scene i thought oh i saw the peacemaker one i'm good i saw him and then i walked out of the theater so i totally missed it and i would have stuck around to see two seconds of mr mine because man i love that character yeah um yeah who knows maybe mr mind will both these post credit scenes will set up a Justice Society movie in the future. And I'm looking at Mr. Mind uh, in that post credit scene. I'm thinking, man, I'm sure James Gunn are, would love to do yep. something with Mr. Mind. Oh, like, yeah. There's no character that I can think of that James Gunn would love to do more in the DC universe than this little mind controlling uh, caterpillar. Yeah. Bit right in the peacemaker there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I mean, there you go. All right. So, last question that we're going to end on is. What's 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 the future hold for Shazam? Obviously, we've talked about this a little bit. Um, my thought process is, like I said, there's not a real future for a, a solo Shazam film, and I'm not saying that in a mean way or a bad way. You know, it has nothing to do with the box office or the critics. Um, it doesn't even have to do with Sandberg potentially leaving. You know, superhero films and not being involved. I really truly believe that we need to like deviate from the whole family stories in the future not that it can't work but i don't think it will work with the you know just doing it a third time i don't see it happening um do i think it will happen no i, I and i hate to say this because i like the character and i think they did a great job with both of these films because they're so outside of the box of everything else that we've gotten from the dc universe uh, or the dc eu or the Zack snyder universe or whatever however you want to put it um it's so different from that that i really liked what they did but i just and, and i like it in a way that i don't like some other films like birds of prey is different but not in a way that i enjoyed it um you know like i thought this was so much well more it was so much better written than the first one and so many of the other recent DC films. Black Adam, One Roman 2, um, or One Roman 1984. I thought it was better than all of those. Um, I don't know what should happen, but I hope that the character sticks around. That's all I can hope for. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. I mean, I know what I would like to happen. I would really like it, they would have to make this movie like today or tomorrow, but I would like to see them pick up some of the pieces of that second Jeff Johns volume of Shazam because they adapted the first one for the first movie, but pick up maybe little bits of Shazam and the Magic Lands, particularly that one uh, angle of the story where Mr. Mine controls Billy Batson's dad and brings him back in Billy Batson's life only to like forge this relationship between father like estranged father and son for the sake of getting Billy to share his powers with his dad. And so then Mr. Mine has the powers and it's like this whole thing. And then at the end of it, you realize that like once Mr. Mind is like gone from controlling, you know, his dad's body, his dad really like had no interest or care either in anything Billy was doing. He was just kind of like some, it's, you know, just some guy. But, like, that angle of it, I would have loved to have seen that, like, as a Shazam movie. I feel like it could be a cool third one and pay off a little bit with Mr. Mine. You would probably just have to add, like, some more Monster Society guys or something into it to make it a little more action-packed at the end. But the ne- I feel the next time we're going to see Shazam, he's going to have to be fully Zachary Levi Shazam 
in part of some team because the kids like I'm surprised we got two movies. Uh, it, the first one came out when 2019. Yes. Like yeah. That. So yeah. So I mean, these kids in a few years, the kid who's playing Billy Batson could probably be like, "Hey, why don't I just play uh, Shazam?" So yeah, it's gonna have to be. They're gonna have to kind of slowly back away. If you we saw it with the second one, it's a different. The Mary Marvel uh, is a different actress than the first one as Powered Mary. So they're gonna have to maybe slowly ace part of the cast out or just stick with Zachary Levi. And uh, I thought that was going to be what we end on, but I, I just found an article that is extremely important to bring up because it answers a couple of the questions we just came. So it turns out the Hollywood Reporter talked with Sandberg uh, just this uh, on Saturday, as a matter of fact, uh, this interview posted, and he clarifies some of the interesting things. So originally the Gal Gadot thing was, was not – the intent was always to have her in the film, but he truly believed that it was going to get screwed over and they were going to end up having a headless cameo just like they did with – Superman from the first film and he was really upset by the potential of that happening but it didn't and he got Gal Gadot but they decided to put in the scene with the wizard poking fun at the idea of the headless cameo um, and that's why the wizard takes the body of Wonder Woman in that one sequence um, so there's that he also said that the original plan for the mid credit scene was to include characters from Black Adam who were part of the Justice Society uh, but the plans fell through the last minute, and because Peter Safran was the uh, producer for the Suicide Squad and Peacemaker, he made some phone calls, and uh, Harcourt and Economos were able to get on set very quickly, and that's why that scene came to be what it was. But it was intended to be Justice Society characters, and that just didn't end up playing out the way they intended. Um, he also made a comment about how he was kind of ticked about how the TV spot that you mentioned earlier, uh, talked, you know, revealed Wonder Woman because he really wanted that to be a complete surprise for anybody who was going to see. So he was kind of disappointed by that. Um, but he, he, he went on to say a bunch of different things. I'll link the article in the uh, show notes, um, or the episode description, uh, as you re as you're listening to this, uh, head over to the websites and look at the episode show notes to be able to find the article but he, he talks about a bunch of different things and he also talks about the different things related to how covid kind of delayed things and put things into motion that they didn't necessarily were they weren't necessarily planning on and things like that so it's a good read uh definitely check it out uh but it qu answers that question of you know what was happening with the mid credit scene what was the plan for just society he also said that that was filmed way before Saffron and Gunn uh, took over DC Studio Studios. So we know that that was obviously, we know that they took over in November of 2022. So clearly way before that, because I also read a different comment saying that in November, Saffron had made a comment uh, publicly to in an interview that the Shazam film was complete. They were done. They had everything set. It was intended to come out They like they had originally planned. They moved up the date to be in December and then ended up adjusting it back. But it was not because the film was not complete or anything like that. It was legitimately because they just were trying to shift around the, the dates to make it work better for the releases for what they were trying to do. Um, so that's interesting to a degree. Um it also kind of bodes into that comment, the, the conspiracy that was out there last fall about how Warner Brothers was losing or Warner Brothers Discovery was losing so much money that they only had enough money to market one film last year. And that's why they ended up going with Black Adam and they ended up shifting everything into this year was because that way they'd have more marketing money. But I figured it was worth mentioning. Um, still, still, I, I always am blown away by, you know, all these theories and comments and rumors and how they end up getting you know squashed so as always i think we're gonna have to wait till after the flash to see what the future of everything exactly 
All right, so with that, that is going to be everything for this episode of the Batman Universe podcast. I want to encourage everybody to head over to the website, thebatmanuniverse.net, for all kinds of news, original content, other podcasts, reviews, editorials, all kinds of different stuff related to movies, TV, merchandise, video games, comics, and everything else related to the Bat fandom. Be sure to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, YouTube. All of our social links can be found at the top of the page over at thebatmanuniverse.net. If you're interested in supporting us, uh, be sure to head over to the site. There is a spot towards the bottom that says Support TBU. There's a bunch of different ways you can support us and what we do to bring content for you guys um is you know like everything from affiliate links to patreon all kinds of different stuff check it out um outside of that if you want to get in touch with us send us an email tbu at the batmanuniverse.net or leave a comment wherever you are listening to this as it will come back to us and we will talk about those on the future episodes if you are interested in well, I'll just put this out there. So in the coming weeks, I was planning on uh, having a topic, and I'll just I'll just float this out there for our listeners to decide on whether or not they'd actually like to hear it, uh, mostly because I, I think it's going to be kind of like a, a, a extremely negative episode, and people might not want that. But I was thinking about doing a uh, review of the Gotham Knights, um, the first episode. Um <clears throat> it's out. The second episode's right around the corner. As you're listening to this, it's already out. And, uh, you know, like, hey, we could hate watch a show and see what, see, it, see how it was. Uh, but if you don't want us to do that and you'd rather us wait till the end of the first season, we can certainly do that as well. But I'd like to hear your thoughts. So maybe we'll throw a poll up on Twitter or something after the episode releases, uh, leaving you guys with the option of what you'd like to see in the future. Um, but if you have any other ideas, shoot them over to us. We're always open to different ideas of what we can do for uh, different topics that we can cover here on the podcast. So with all that being said, for BJ, Scott, and myself, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the TBU Podcast, and we'll see you guys next time.